Good evening and welcome. I'm Colleen Parsons. I teach in the English department at Georgetown University and I'm the director of the Global Irish Studies program at Georgetown. It's my pleasure to welcome you tonight and uh, first of all to acknowledge our co-hosts, principally the uh, Ambassador of Ireland to the US, Ambassador Dan Mulhall and the Embassy of Ireland, but also Solus Nua, DC's Organisation for Contemporary Irish Arts and Poetry Ireland and our own colleagues here at Georgetown University at the Georgetown Humanities Initiative. Just at the outset, I want to draw your attention to a few events we have coming up shortly, um, especially the one that's happening right after this webinar. So at 6 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time, that's 11 p.m. Irish Time, if you're still awake, uh, Gabriel Byrne will be in conversation with Roddy Doyle, hosted by Politics and Prose, um, and then Kevin Barry next week on the 24th of January will be in conversation with Mark O'Connell. These are two events that are the, the latest in our series of Irish authors in conversation in association with politics and prose, the Embassy of Ireland and Solus Nua. And you'll find more details on our website and there are links being shared in the chat uh, right now about these events. Also on January 28th, Global Irish Studies will host a discussion of Ireland's culture of secrecy and shame surrounding sex, childbirth and adoption, and the regulation of, and institutionalization of women's bodies uh, throughout the 20th century. And at this event, we'll hear from authors of two recent moving books, Killen Hogan and Katrina Palmer. And this will be moderated by Professor Margot Backus of the University of Houston. Again, you can see our website, globalirish.georgetown.edu for details on that. And finally, on the 1st of February, which uh, anybody uh, Irish here will know, that's Loy Le Brigia, the Feast of St. Bridget, um, Poetry Ireland and the Embassy of Ireland will um, feature a lineup of African-American poets of Irish heritage and African-Irish poets. That is Amanda Johnson, Kimberly Reyes, um, Nithi Casa and Felicia Olesanya. Um, so watch out for uh, information about that in the coming weeks. Check um, Twitter and, and your email, email account um, for information about that. Um, but tonight, obviously, we're gathered on a very different mission. The webinar tonight comes from Washington, D.C., a city in a state of suspended animation right now, locked down and bruised after a long and difficult year. We've all had a long and difficult year but it has culminated here in DC in the attack on the Capitol building last week. And this is a city that is garrisoned right now. And one in which likely all of us welcome the chance on the eve of tomorrow's inauguration to turn our eyes away briefly from what's been unfolding in front of our eyes and towards the words of a poet who knew more than most how to live in and write about and speak to the turbulent times we live in balancing what he called the quarrel with ourselves that makes poetry with a commitment to being a public intellectual and a chronicler of his time, complicated as it was. As almost everybody watching this must surely know, Yeats's poetry, along with Seamus, po Seamus Heaney's poetry and Joyce's prose, will likely be the daily fodder of the White House for the next four years, as the most prominent lover of Irish literature in the world right now, Joe Biden, moves in. But we pause tonight ahead of tomorrow's inauguration and ahead of what I hope is an inevitable onslaught of Yeatsian quotations to come to reflect on why it is that Yeats's words and Yeats, as we remember, wrote that words alone are certain good. Why it is that those words keep, in the, as Joe Hassett writes, echoing into life. And there's no better guide to this enduring power of Yeats's lines to soothe, to explain, and to provoke our thoughts, then the book we're celebrating tonight, Joe Hassett's Yates Now Echoing Into Life. I'll give you an idea of what this beautiful book looks like, but we'll talk about this book. We'll talk about what's in it as well, not just what it looks like uh, in a very short time, for a very short time. Um, Joe, by, uh, Joe uh, Hassett, there's a good Freudian slip there. Joe Hassett borrows from John Keats to explain Yates's enduring power. Keats writes that a poem should strike the reader as a wording of his own highest thoughts and appear almost a remembrance. And I think for any of us who have read and reread and pondered over and rethought Yeats's words, that's exactly what we see in them. 
So tonight, I'll give you a sense of what's to come. Tonight, we're going to talk with um, three uh, really outstanding scholars and practitioners of poetry, Joe Hassif, Paula Meehan, and Terry Cross Davis. And then we'll hear from Ambassador Dan Mulhall um, with his own reflections on Yeats's work, but also on Joe's words, followed by and ended with a performance of one of Yeats's poems by the Irish mezzo-soprano Tara Eracht. But we're going to begin with another performance. We have the supreme pleasure of hearing Lisa Dwan read for us three of Yeats's poems after a few words for Joe Hassett. Lisa, I think, will be very many known, very well known to many of you. She's an actor best known for her acclaimed performance and adaptations of Samuel Beckett's work. And the New York Times described her as an instrument of Beckett in the way that saints and martyrs are said to be instruments of God. Duan won the Emery Battis Award for a performance in Harold Pinter's The Lover uh, and the collection at the Shakespeare Theatre Company. Um, and following their recent success on Beckett's shorts, uh, Lisa Duan will once again team up with Sir Trevor Nunn to play Winnie in Beckett's Happy Days in February 2021. I know we're all really looking forward to that. And Lisa took some very precious time out from filming Colin Tobin's adaptation of Antigone, Pale Sister, again directed by Trevor Nunn, to record this message and these poems. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Lisa reading The Stairs Nest by My Window, The Cold Heaven, and Adam's Curse. And we'll see you in a few minutes. Um, hello, uh, I'm Lisa Dewan, and um, it's a privilege to be with you all this evening to celebrate this extraordinary book. Echoing into life um, really echoes um, Joe's approach, um, not only to Yeats, but to poetry, but also to life. And anyone who knows or has the privilege of knowing Joe Hassett, as a lot of us here tonight, I'm sure, do share that um, gift um, of knowing him, know that what he sees and uncovers and treasures and discovers all those virtues um, within poetry in Ireland, what's left of them, uh, I'm only joking, um, but in Yeats, lie deep within um, Joe. And any of us who've had the privilege of reading him, but talking to him, conversing with him, enjoying and having the, 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 the special gift of his friendship knows that he, um, he discovers that, that wonder um, and unpacks that from deep within himself and gives it to all of us as a gift, lives it. And um, he and this book are a wonderful thing. And it is such a deep privilege and gift to know him and call him my friend. Um, I wish you the best of luck with it, Joe. The Stairs Nest by My Window The bees build in the crevices of loosening masonry and there the mother birds bring grubs and flies. My wall is loosening honey bees. Come, build in the empty house of the stairs. We are closed in, and the key is turned on our uncertainty. Somewhere a man is killed or a house burned. Come, build in the empty house of the stair. A barricade of stone or of wood, some 14 days of civil war. Last night they trundled down the road, that young soldier in his blood. Come, build in the empty house of the stair. We had fed the heart on fantasies. The heart's grown brutal from the fair. More substance in our enmities than in our love. Oh, 
honeybees. Come, build in the empty house of the stair. The cold heaven. Suddenly, I saw the cold and rook delighting heaven that seemed as though ice burned and was but more ice. And thereupon, imagination and heart were driven so wild that every casual thought of that and this vanished and left but memories that should be out of season with the hot blood of youth, of love, crossed long ago. And I took all the blame out of all sense and reason until I cried and trembled and rocked to and fro, riddled with light. Ah, when the ghost begins to quicken, Confusion of the deathbed over. It is sent out naked on the roads, as the books say, and stricken by the injustice of the skies for punishment. We sat together at one summer's end, that beautiful mild woman, your close friend, and you and I, and talked of poetry. I said, a line will take us hours, maybe, yet if it does not seem a moment's thought, or stitching and unstitching has been naught. Better go down upon your marrow bones and scrub a kitchen pavement or break stones like an old pauper in all kinds of weather for two articulate sweet sounds together is to work harder than all these. And yet, we thought an idler by the noisy set of bankers, schoolmasters and clergymen the martyrs call the world. And thereupon that beautiful mild woman, for whose sake there's many a one, shall find out all heartache on finding that her voice is sweet and low replied. To be born woman is to know, though they do not talk of it at school, that we must labour to be beautiful. I said, it's certain there's no fine thing since Adam's fall, but needs much labouring. There have been lovers who thought love should be so much compounded of high courtesy that they would sigh and quote with learned looks, precedence out of beautiful old books. Yet that now seems an idle trade enough. We sat grown quiet at the name of love. We saw the last embers of daylight die. And in the trembling blue-green of the sky, a moon, worn as if it had been a shell, washed by time's waters as they rose and fell about the stars and broke in days and years, I had a thought for no one's but your ears. That you were beautiful. And that I strove to love you in the old highway of love. That it had all seemed happy. And yet we'd grown as weary hearted as that. Hollow moon. Extraordinary performance there by Lisa, uh, a friend of Joe's, and as we said, really one of the best Beckett actors um, to have lived. Uh, and, and looking forward to her performance of Happy Days, 
um, this February. I'm joined today by Joe Hassett, by Terry Cross Davis, and by Paul Meehan to launch Joe's really excellent new book, Yates Now, Echoing Into Life. I'll so, uh, hold it up here again. And I just, I, I, I won't say too much. I'll leave it to Paula and to Terry and to Joe um, to talk about the book. But I just want to give you a flavor of what the book is like. It's a series of short quotations from Yeats's poems um, with Joe's really incredible meditations on those lines. And a reminder for us, a reminder to us for why those lines still mean uh, so much for us today and have echoed through the centuries and are in many ways even more relevant now than even at the moment that Yeats wrote them. But I want to say that these are not aphorisms, they're not axioms. Joe doesn't think of them that way. They're not, they're not brittle, <laughs> they're not unmoving. They're short machines for thinking and machines for feeling about what Joe calls the threshold occasions of our lives and that we return to over and over again. Um, if that speaks to you, you should run out and grab a copy of this book right now. But if that doesn't speak to you, we've got three amazing guests to help think through Yeats and Joe Hassett's words uh, today. Poet Terry Ellen Cross Davis is the author of, and she tells me it is now available for purchase, A More Perfect Union, uh, which will be out in February 2021 with Mad Creek Books. Um, it was the 2019 winner of the, the journal Charles B. Wheeler Poetry Prize, She's also the author of an extraordinary collection, Haint, winner of the 2017 Oiana Book Prize, uh, our book award for poetry. She's awarded the Poetry Society of America's Robert H. Winner Memorial Prize in 2020. And um, many people here in DC will also know her for the, the really amazing she, work she does as the poetry coordinator for the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, DC. Terry, welcome, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. We're also joined by Paula Meehan, Irish poet, playwright, author of the poetry collections, Return and No Blame, Reading the Sky, Pillow, I can't read them all. There's so many, Pillow Talk, Dharmakaya, which won the Dennis Devlin Award, Six Sycamores, and with the artist uh, Marie Foley, Painting Rain and more. Her numerous awards uh, and honors include the Martin Tonder Award, the Butler Literary Award, and she was appointed to the prestigious post of Ireland Professor of Poetry. In 2015, she was inducted into the Hennessy Hall of Fame for her achievements in poetry. And her selected poems, As If By Magic, a beautiful cover, if I can stop talking about covers, but these really are beautiful, uh, were published by Daedalus Press in 2020. Thanks, Paula, for uh, joining us. A great pleasure, great pleasure to be here. And finally, most importantly, I will say, Joe Hassett, a leading trial lawyer, authoritative literary critic based here in Washington, D.C. Joe, as many of you will know, has written extensively on Yeats, Joyce, and other Irish writers. He holds a PhD in Anglo-Irish literature from University College Dublin and is a graduate of Canisius College and Harvard Law School. And his books include W.B. Yeats and the Muses, Oxford University Press 2010, the Ulysses Trials, Beauty and Truth Meet the Law. And I will say Joe uh, came to my class in Georgetown uh, last year, I think, to talk about that book. And uh, we were absolutely spellbound, the story of the Ulysses Trials. And now, of course, Yates now, Echoing into Life from Lilliput Press. But those are just the biographical details, much more than that. Joe is a friend, he's a neighbor, an advisor, and a champion. And I don't mean just to us in Georgetown University. I mean that Joe is all of those things to everyone he meets, and especially to anyone having to do with the world of the arts in Ireland. Uh, Virginia Woolf, Joe quotes Virginia Woolf in Yeats now, talking about Yeats. It's a really great uh, description of Yeats. She says, um, whenever you cut him with a question, he poured, spurted fountains of ideas. And I think we all know and anybody who knows Joe knows that he pours and spurts fountains of ideas, but also of Yeats's poetry. Mm. Um, but this is the book in many ways, and Joe, I'll start maybe with a question to you. I feel like this is the book in many ways that um, you've been waiting to write for a very long time. Anybody who knows you knows that Yeats's words 
these lyrics, these lines, these uh, sort of mesmer mesmerizing words have been on the tip of your tongue always. And so maybe I could ask you to give us a sense of where this book came from, um, your inspiration and, and even the process of writing it. Well, thank you, Colleen, and thanks uh, to everybody who's participating. Thanks to Lisa for those amazing, uh, generous words, which I treasure deeply. And thanks on behalf of our whole audience for the enormous treat of hearing your reading of those beautiful poems. Um, well, Colleen, and thank you, Colleen, thanks everyone. Um, you know, the, the, the book is organized around lines of Yeats's poetry, and I hadn't intended actually to quote uh, two lines, uh, but I think I'll start with them and then I'll, in the Irish way, get back to answering the question. <laughs> the two lines that are in my mind are the famous two lines that are in uh, the Municipal Gallery Revisited, where Yeats is looking around the gallery at portraits of his friends and uh, founders of the Irish state. And he says, think where man's glory most begins and ends and say my glory was I had such friends. So in, in listening to Lisa's beautiful words and uh, knowing each of you who are participating, uh, those thoughts were in my mind. Now, as to the origin of the book, it had seemed to me that uh, a lot of people who don't uh, necessarily consider themselves readers of poetry, nonetheless, when they're facing some threshold occasion, ask some friend of theirs whom they think of as a reader of poetry, can you give me a line of poetry that might fit this occasion? And Yeats had an extraordinary ability to be just that poet because he had an ability to distill the emotions that surrounded uh, events in personal life or in uh, national or global life. And he could put those thoughts into a very memorable words. And uh, I think that a lot of people, well, many people have not had the benefit of the wisdom that's in those words because Yeats has a reputation for being difficult and that you have to get through a lot of philosophy or politics or something else to get to the poetry. And so it seemed to me that <clears throat> looking at the, some of the lines, line by line, uh, was a way to distill and get access to the wisdom. And then frequently, uh, once you were kind of owned that line, you got into the poem and you were more interested in the whole poem and then you led to, to another poem and to another. Um, so the idea behind the book and what, what made it come into life uh, was to look at the poems line by line and uh, find that wisdom echoing back into life. It's, a, it's also though, um, the object itself, the book itself, is an extraordinarily beautiful book with its cover sort of reminiscent of Sturge Moore's cover for The Winding Stair, for Yeats' The Winding Stair. Uh, and inside there are reproductions of manuscript pages, pictures of, and I know you well, I know you know Thur Bali Lee well, and pictures from Thur Bali Lee of Yeats, um, for example, um, uh, hanging out in a garden in London. In many ways, it's a, it's a sort of the, the words, Yeats's words are surrounded by the objects of his life um, and the objects of the archives. And I, I guess I wanted to ask you a little bit about your choices in designing the book and in bringing us to Yeats's archive as much as to his words. Well, great. Thanks, Colleen. I'm glad you, uh, you mentioned that. And uh, hats off to Anthony Farrell at Little Foot Press, who yeah. is, is interested in beautiful books, and uh, Marcia Swan, who designed the book. Uh, and uh, um, everybody at, at Lilliput uh, who made a beautiful book and who were interested in, in, in making a beautiful book. And uh, Niall McCormick who designed the cover. And you mentioned the Sturge Moore uh, uh, winding stair. I don't know if you could see, there's a photo of the actual winding stair inside Tor Bailey Lee on the one side. And on the other is the Sturge Moore uh, cover for Yeats's volume called The Winding Stair. Uh, Yeats also, the volume that preceded the winding stair was called the tower and that's the Sturge, Sturge Boer, uh, the tower cover. So uh, our cover uh, is a pastiche in a way or an homage to the Sturge Boer cover. And part of the idea was um, 
Yeats had this interesting observation that a, a, a lyric poem uh, can uh, take on a second beauty, passing out of literature, as it were, and into life. And so I kind of had the image in my own mind of uh, the words coming down from the tower where he spent the summers in the middle of his life and echoing down that staircase into life. Now, you wouldn't, I, I tried to uh, sell Andy Farrell on the idea of using that uh, photograph on the cover. And he said, no, it looked like echoing into a dungeon. <laughs> so <laughs> well, maybe, maybe we could draw one. And <laughs> Fortunately, I mean, I, I take it. I take it. Yates's tower wasn't very comfortable. <laughs> no, I think it wasn't. It was a real stone tower. Well, but it's the most amazing place. And uh, you know, Sylvia Plath said you could when she went there with Ted Hughes and Richard Murphy. She said she could sense Yates's presence, and I'll be darned. But you can, you can, and you do. Um, so the tower was very much in my mind in the making of the book and in the images in the book. Um, also, uh, uh, the, the cool, uh, my children know how much I love cool in the poem, The Wild Swans at Cool. Um, and so it's some beautiful photographs of the wild swans at cool in the book. Uh, Seamus Heaney's beautiful poem, Postscript, uh, involves some swans uh, just up the road on the uh, Clare shore of Galway Bay. And uh, he said to me one time, I might as well have called it The Wild Swans at Clare. And so I have a beautiful photo uh, um, by Deirdre Holmes of some wild swans at Cool and at Clare. And uh, one other thing I want to mention about the images in the book is, uh, and I want to thank the National Library of Ireland, uh, Sandra Collins, particularly, and uh, Catherine McSherry uh, for all their help on the book and the uh, special collections at UCD, University College Dublin, for their contribution of artifacts uh, that make up the book. But uh, uh, the National Library uh, gave me this beautiful image of Yeats's ring, uh, which uh, his wife, George, commissioned for him just before their marriage. Uh, and he wrote a poem explaining it, which includes the line, and wisdom is a butterfly and not a gloomy bird of prey. And this beautiful ring is uh, on loan from the Yeats family uh, in the National Library of Ireland, and uh, it's part of the beautiful exhibit there. And uh, all of these and you and you I, go ahead. Yeah, well, I was just, you also you quote Vila Sackville West uh, that great description of uh, the work of art or poetry to clap the net over the butterfly of the moment. Exactly. Um, what a what a what a fantastic description, and it really captures, I think, what you're trying to do when you pick on these sort of lines here and there. I might turn to Terry um, for a second and just ask, uh, and you know, give, give both Terry and Paul a, a, an opportunity to talk about um, something that, that struck you from Joe's book um, before we talk about Yates himself, but about the, the book itself, um, something that has stuck with you or that you found most valuable. Terry, I know you had a chance to look at it. Oh, sure. Um, <laughs> I think you should see this book. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's full of love in tabs. Um, <laughs> but one of the things that, that struck me, and I will say it struck me, um, you know, as a lover of poetry and as a poet, was the moment when, in the chapter, the moment alive, and Joe begins talking about kind of what to me is at the heart of what, what we do as poets, trying to capture that moment and keep it alive and make it accessible for readers after we are long gone. And, you know, this book does that for Yates. I mean, as someone coming into Yates, um, as someone who, I, I think anyone who's coming into Yates, anyone who is new to Yates, this is such a perfect book for you um, in that regard, because Joe has done such a great job of kind of mapping out these themes and giving you access into them. But that, that for one throb of the artery, and Joe talks about this in a meditation in time of war, that internal beauty can be accessed instantaneously because transcendent experience can occur in one throb of the artery. Um, so Joe, I'm just telling you now, as you know, poets feel everything. Uh, I, I might be uh, stealing that or working with that in some way um, <laughs> because I, I pass it on to my husband who's a poet too. And we just, just we really just, just my, we were in, in thrall um, with that line about that whole idea of just for one throb of the artery trying to capture just the idea of that butterfly of the moment, that net 
and creating words to create that net, to capture that butterfly and pin it down for all of us to see and admire in terms of colors and the distinct ways in which these things can be arranged to remind us of what's so great about this life. Um, so that, and that too, and just the fact that there are so many wonderful themes throughout the whole book was so impressive to me because he, he, he takes these general kind of moments and allows you the specificity of Yeats's words to let them shine, to, to really buff them up and shine them. And I think that's, it's just so awesome because I think like you said, Joe, for anyone who has any issue in getting into poetry, this is such a perfect book to tell you that poetry really is about those small moments that we capture you know, and, and how we relate to them and, and what we pull in terms of lyric beauty from them to share with others. So, but that, that I, I'm gonna call it arterial throb. That, that moment <laughs> stuck with me and I just could not let it go. I was like, that's it. That's why we do this thing, this craft, this job. You know, we really try and capture those moments of transcendence and, and make them real and make them alive on the page for others years, decades, centuries later. Paula. Yeah, great. Joe, I'm delighted to be here to help you celebrate this amazing book. And I read the book first in a draft when the, the ink was still wet. And <laughs> I've seen it condense into this form over the months. And last October, when it was launched over here in Ireland, um, again, I read through and just you used the word net, I think, Colleen, and you used it as well, Terry Cross. And I had this sense with the book of a, a fisherman hauling in this net of ideas and people Yeats was connected to and uh, resonant images from his life all brought together for us here. And it's a fantastic lens to either introduce somebody to Yeats or to reacquaint yourself with Yeats if you had him back in the day in school. And, but it's more than Yeats um, echoing into, into our lives. It's Joe coming in like uh, in his rags of light, the lovely phrase from the cold heaven, riddled with light. And it is a book riddled with light. I first, as I said, read it cover to cover, but over the months of this wild pandemic, I've been using it much as Yeats might have if it was on his desk as a kind of a scrying book. Oh, what might the day bring? And I'll open it at random. And I'm totally then riveted into a place of wisdom and insight that really does help me get through these strange days. Today, um, when I got up, I went towards the end of the book and I saw his gravestone with Patti Smith's, your great song maker and poet, her uh, photograph of, of Yeats's grave. And it's amazing to me that when visitors come to Ireland, especially people who've had him as part of their uh, education, they want to go and visit his grave. They want to see it. Um, I remember Ginsburg coming. Where would you like to see in Ireland? Yeats's grave. So this sense of the half-life of a great poet echoing on like um, he's had a half-life of over 100 years. He's 150 two years now uh, since he was born and his half-life is still echoing on and on. So congratulations, Joe. Thanks, Paul. Well, I might, I might actually follow that up um, um, because I was thinking as you're talking about a scrying book, I was thinking about, you know, on the one hand, Joe gives us a sense of Yeats being a poet of the everyday, of the quotidian, the ordinary. He has sections on marriage, on children, on friendship, I mean, there is also war and those other things. On the other hand, there's something else that we all know about Yeats and that I love your description of the scrying book because there's something really supernatural about the idea of a scrying book, right? So that you can you know, open a book and find your way. And I, and I guess I, I know that you're a great admirer of an often maligned element in Yeats's poetry. And that is the spiritualism of the nearness of the dead to the living. Uh, Joe chooses that as one of the, uh, one of the sort of uh, uh, section headings. And I wonder, you know, we, we think about how Yeats, you know, continues to live for us today. And obviously there's a spiritual and sort of supernatural element of that, but in many ways, that's one of the elements of Yeats that's most strange and most yeah. unusual to us and most um, awkward in a sense in our, in our disenchanted world. But you don't think that that's true, right? 
Well, I had a grandmother whose first thing every morning, she would tell us her dreams and she would offer to read the cups. And in a strange way, the teacups, in a strange way, she exerted a kind of force field of control over her wild daughters through this. So I would see his, um, his deep involvement in uh, fairness and the world beyond the veil, I would see this as something that he rooted in folk wisdom as well. I know I was discouraged as a secondary school student from, oh, that was silly Willie and his, you know, his cards and his horoscopes and all that. Uh, don't waste your time over there. But he was insistent. He wrote to the Fenian, uh, John O'Leary. He wrote saying, magic after poetry is the most important central thing of my life. And we must take him at his words. But where for me it connects and makes a lot of sense is that this space he allowed for meditation with cards, with his own horoscope, with the, the, the meditation on the greater cycles were funneled down into the practical craft of his poetry making. And that's where the magic, I think, resides. And it's no accident that these amazingly well-made constructed poems just reverberate on and on. Um, so I see the magic as a very practical thing. There was a deal of um, table tipping and, uh, you know, it's, it, that's a whole area that's full of charlatans then as well as now. So you must always put a lot of pressure on um, how you interpret his engagement. I mean, it's always, I thought is lovely really, and I, I love to tell students this, that while his fellow poets were out being shot for their part in the revolution, he was designing his um, robes because he'd just become chief wizard in the hermetic order of the golden dawn. And yet we need that. And paradoxically that our national poet could be both this kooky kind of guy and a, a man of great action and directness and uh, power in his art. And that was the power he was after. But I love that that is funneled into the making of these amazing poems. Yeah, and that, that, actually, that actually leads me to a question for Terry, um, because, you know, and, 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 and Joe's book picks, picks up on this, on this private Yeats, very much, and Joe, you know, very much on the, the Yeats, the lover of Maud Gone. Um, uh, that we see over and over again, um, as well as obviously Florence Farr and George Yates and others. Um, mm. But, you know, go ahead, Joe. No, no. Oh, no. Uh, um, so in a sense, there's a, there's a sort of a, there's a private Yates, but he also is a public man, right? And so what, what Paula talks about as these sort of these huge, these scales of difference in a sense across Yates's work. So, so on the one hand, he's, you know, he's a senator, he's a school inspector, he's a theater manager. But he's also the sort of the, the poet of love and the poet of intense emotion and the poet of the strangeness of the of the hermetic dawn. And I, I guess I wanted to turn to you, Terry, and think about your work as a sort of a as a public poet as well. Um, uh, and think about, you know, so let's say that, you know, the, the sort of the, the, the intensity of paint um, and then the work is as also, you know, curating the, the Folger libraries, uh, Folger Shakespeare's libraries, public poetry. In many ways, that echoes those sort of scales of life that Yeats um, himself encountered. And I want to give you a chance to talk a little bit about how those, the sort of inner and outer facing po um, poets um, can come together in a way in Yeats's work or in your work. Well, and I think it's, it's again, once Joe's book gives some great clarity, a thought to this um, in the chapter on work. Um, and he talks a lot about, you know, is it either happiness or art as Rilke writes? I'm in Joe quotes, um, or is it more like Zadie Smith said, it's like trying to re-examine the checks and balances. And that's also another one of the great things too about this book is that Joe brings in all these other voices that have been influenced by Yeats. And I just think it's a really incredible way to kind of chart the seismograph, like a seismograph of poetic influence. Um, and you can see these little earthquakes here and bigger ones over here. Um, but yeah, as a public and private person in, and as a poet, it has to be that the well of poetry runs deep within me because I tap it on both fronts. 
I tap it in one regard during the day, I am all about championing the work of others, of getting people uh, into poetry. I call myself a poetry proselytizer for this reason. I, I, you know, if you tell me that you don't like poetry, I'll find a poem just for you um, <laughs> that will open you up to the idea of it. Um, and so it, it becomes this idea of this work-life balance, which I thought was really interesting that Joe, you know, talked about, but it also becomes the idea of I don't have to subsist on poetry as a living per se. So it gives me a fluidity and a flexibility um, that I know a lot of my uh, peers don't always have. And I think it, it allows me to still feel as if I can, um, like I said, it, that I can, I can bring other people up during the day and, and make sure that people are feeling tuned into poetry, but yet still have enough that I can tap and create my own work. Um, and thanks to residencies and retreats, like, you know, things like these, um, they help keep me centered as a poet in my own work, but then they also still at the same time help introduce me to other poets. So it's, it's, a, it's a checks and balances. There are times when maybe it's too much energy on one end and not enough on another, but I, I like what Zadie Smith said in Joe's book, that it is that checks and balances and you have to go in. And I think a lot about, um, the way that Yates went about kind of this public private life, they all influence each other in so many ways in my mind, looking at his work, especially the private and thinking about himself as one of the last romantics. Um, and just thinking that he, in many ways, was trying to capture the ephemeral and that that, that work is a lifelong work and that poetry becomes this gem that you turn and turn and turn and look at the sunlight go through it and all the different facets and all the different rainbows that can erupt from just one angle of looking at the world. Um, <laughs> I'm thinking of another poet uh, and, and that is just a certain slant of light to change everything. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's that public and private, I think as long as the well is deep enough to feed both and poetry is the thing that can sustain the soul. We've seen it, we're seeing it now. During this pandemic, it's the first thing I think a lot of people turn to when they realize how shut away they had to be as human beings from the social part of ourselves, then what do we feed? We feed this internal part of ourselves and what helps us get there is poetry. It helps us with that clarity. It stills the water so you can see deeper within. When in the book said it best, you know, poetry is life is still. And I hear, and I love the echo and I love the echo in, you know, for, for Joe's title, but it echoes everywhere throughout this book, how to feed the soul with these lyrical gems, how to sustain the human and our human connection with poetry. So that public and private is about having a deep enough well to do both. Yeah, and-, and, I just, and, um, and I, Colleen, can I- Yeah, Joe, go ahead. A quick word only because it's typical of Terry that in speaking about public facing poetry, she didn't mention uh, her own <laughs> roles one in the uh, poetry in the schools at the Folger and the other uh, yesterday was her annual, uh, not just another day off uh, production, uh, which you can find on folger.edu, um, an amazing uh, presentation of poetry and oratory and thought by African-American uh, poets and uh, writers of all kind. And of course, by Martin Luther King. Uh, it's just a breathtaking, uh, inspirational journey of about 45 minutes uh, put together every year by Terry. And uh, it, it's just something that uh, everybody ought to be seeing and thinking about. And uh, uh, so to, to Terry, also with her poetry in the schools, is uh, uh, she's out on the, she's a frontline worker. <laughs> she's out there every day at taking poetry to the people and people to poetry. and people into new realms of poetry and it's just extraordinary work that she does and you'd all be interested to see it at folger.edu not just another day off thank you can so i ask you. a can i ask a uh, can i ask a um a somewhat uh, um cheeky question which is uh, you know i began by talking about we're in we're in washington dc joe and terry and i um um paula not to leave you out there but um you're probably better off somewhere else just right now um, uh, and there is, of course, to use that Yeats term, a, a conflagration in the rafters. Um, that the the world that we live in, and the sort of the EV, the, the sort of the hushed expectation of what will happen tomorrow, uh, in many ways here in the city, um, leave us with a, a lot of time to ruminate, to think, to read. And 
I, I asked you, I, I will you know, tell the audience that I, I seeded this question in advance because I thought it'd be a little bit unfair um, to ask them to do this off the, uh, off the, uh, the, the tip of their tongue. Um, but, but I asked Terry, Paula and, and Joe to think about if Joe Biden were indeed, as is not impossible, to quote some lines of Yates tomorrow in the inauguration or at some point in the course of the day, what lines would you wish him to quote? What are the words from Yeats that seem to echo into tonight, this eve of tomorrow's, you know, what is often a huge celebration, but has become something strange here in DC. Um, on the eve of tomorrow's uh, moment, as the sort of sun sets here in Washington DC, and we wait for the morrow, what are the Yeatsian lines that you think will help us wake to another four years in a different world tomorrow. Terry, do you want to give it a shot? Sure, and I couldn't help myself. The first, there's of course the lines in the stairs nest by my window. We had fed the heart on fantasies, the heart's grown brutal from the fair. Um, but then I will tell you as, as, as a black American poet reading Yeats, I came across, oh, do not love too long. And one might think, oh, it's just a romantic poem or what have you, and there's no just, but it's this romantic poem. But here's the thing that hit me. And it was, oh, do not love too long or you will grow out of fashion like an old song. And I thought about America and I thought America has been in this abusive relationship with white supremacy since 1619. And it's time for her to divorce this domestic abuser of white supremacy and look in the mirror and see how beautiful she's grown with all her various colors. And that's while Biden, you know, President-elect Biden might think about that line about feeding the heart and how brutal it's grown. I would hope he thinks about that line about not staring too long um, and being too deeply in love with white supremacy so that we can get this divorce we need and move on. Wow. Paula. Yeah. Bravo. Uh, extraordinary. Bravo. Yeah. Bravo, Terry. Yeah. Um, yes, it's interesting. My first thought, what came to mind were these two lines, but time amends old wrong, and all that is finished, let it fade. So it's a lovely putting away of things, but it was part of a marching song. So I still think it's too militaristic. One of the things that's impressed me about indigenous American thought is the idea that those who have temporal power should try and think seven generations ahead uh, for the consequences of their actions. And I think this beautiful, it's my favorite passage of Yeats, these lines, I think these, these would be a brave and marvelous uh, run of lines to, to hear at the inauguration because it, it respects and honors our interconnectedness. And if this virus has taught us taught us anything, it's, it's all of us or none of us. Oh, chestnut tree, great rooted blossomer, are you the leaf, the blossom or the bowl? Oh, body swayed to music, oh, brightening glance, how can we know the dancer from the dance? Oh, yeah, yeah, those are the words. Joe, do you want to give it a go? It's a hard, it's a hard task. Thank you, Paul. It's, could I maybe take a brief uh, diversion and say, uh, I'd like the current president possibly, I'd like to hear him uh, read the first uh, six words of uh, Lake Isle of Inishry, I will arise and go now. <laughs> If I had to choose <laughs> to choose the Yates, I of course would have chosen uh, the stairs nest by my window, but it's been so beautifully uh, read already by two people. Um, I might read, and Terry, we, uh, your choice was so amazing. Uh, I might take uh, the Yates poem, Politics, which he chose to be the last poem in his collected poems. And maybe we could all read it. It's written as though it's to a young woman. Uh, and at the end, he wants to hold her in his arms. But let's think of that young woman as the other half uh, or the other 70%, all the non-white population of our country. Uh, and picking up on Terry's thought, we need to divorce the white part and hold that other part in our arms. So this is poem, Politics. As I say, Yeats chose it to be the last one in his collected poems, chose it right toward the end of his life. 
And he starts with an epigraph from Thomas Mann, which is in our time, the destiny of man presents its meanings in political terms. And here's Yeats's poem. How can I, that girl standing there, my attention fix on Roman or on Russian or on Spanish politics? Yet here's a travel man that knows what he talks about. And there's a politician that has read and thought. And maybe what they say is true of war and war's alarms. But oh, that I were young again and held her in my arms. Thank you all so very, very much. Thanks, uh, Terry, Paula, Joe. That, that, those, those are really, really excellent lines. Uh, I think, I hope this has given all of you a flavor of the richness of not only Yeats's words, but of Joe's book for the world that we live in. The nuance, the beauty, the flair with which the book Yeats now brings it all to life. At one point, Joe quotes uh, George Steiner's dictum that the best readings of art are art. And I will say that this book is among the best readings of Yeats and it is an art form. It's a very fine masterpiece. I have the pleasure now of handing over. Uh, we, we could, I could, I could listen to Paula and Terry and Joe talk for the next hour, but but we're we're under pressure uh, for time. So I have the pleasure of handing over to uh, for his own reflections on Joe's book and on Yates to our great friend and our neighbor, Ambassador Dan Mulhall. Yes, he is Ireland's 18th ambassador to the U.S., formerly ambassador to London, to Berlin, to Kuala Lumpur. Yes, he's an accomplished historian. Uh, author of New Day Dawning, co-editor of The Shaping of Modern Ireland. And yes, he's a great friend of Joe Hassett. But most importantly of all, Dan is an outstanding scholar and a popularizer of Irish literature. From his daily poetry tweets to his blog on Reading Ulysses, Dan is also the honorary president of the Yeats Society. And he shares with W.B. Yeats a deep commitment to the idea that poetry can and should speak to many publics and should be savored as well as shared that it's part, and this, uh, Terry spoke about this in, 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 in some ways, that it's part of the, the great work of politics as much as it's part of the private moments of our lives. Dan, thanks for joining us. Um, thank you. And I'll hand uh, over to you to, to close out our program and hand over to Tara Aaron. Well, thank you. It's, it's a pleasure to be here and great to be able to pay tribute to, uh, uh, to Joel for the great work he's done over the years and in particular with this book. Just to say, I, I'm, I suppose, uh, a 65-year-old, a 60-odd-year-old, 65-year-old, uh, actually, I'm, I'm going to admit my age, a 65-year-old smiling public man. So naturally, I, I, I have a certain kind of affinity with uh, Yeats's public side. And, and, uh, and in fact, one of the things I love about, about Joe's book is that it, that it, it kind of, um, well, I mean, um, I, when I was uh, studying, uh, when I was writing my MA thesis in UCC, I, I, I wrote about... Uh, Yeats and George Russell, his uh, his friend and accomplice and 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 sometimes rival, um, and um, um, uh, Russell was sometimes uh, you refer to as that myriad-minded man. But actually, Yeats himself was a myriad-minded man. And that and the great thing about Joe's book is that it, it brings out you know the various bits and pieces of Yeats, which which I haven't really. Um, focused on uh, as much as I ought to have. And, and I, I, I regard uh, Joe's book as like a, it's like a greatest hits because he, he draws out the, you know, the great lines from Yeats. And I, I think of Yeats as our Shakespeare, you know, he's a, he's a, he's a great producer of, of, of brilliant lines that shine, have shone, shone through the decades, through the, um, through the sort of um, 80 years since, uh, since Yeats' death. And, and they continue to, uh, to shine brightly today. Um, uh, a, and I'm particularly, obviously, um, um, keen to 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 um, do this today on the eve of of the arrival as the 46th U.S. president of, first of all, a proud Irish American, but secondly, and and in this case, more importantly, a a a, a proud admirer of Irish poetry. But uh, just to say that my um, engagement with Yeats, and, and I have the pleasure and privilege now of being the uh, president of the honorary president of the Yeats Society, uh, really came through. Um, the way in which Yeats echoes into Ireland. So um, I, I first came across this when I was at UCC uh, back in the 1970s, and I bought a copy of Yeats' Selected Poetry. And in the summer of 1975, I, I read it from cover to cover, the first poetry book I ever read like that. And it occurred to me that Yeats's work echoed into what I was interested in that time, which was the history of Ireland, which I have been fascinated by ever since. And I've kind of used Yeats as someone that can echo 
into Irish history. And I've, over the course of my career, I found it extremely useful to be able to call on Yeats as a means of, of explaining uh, Ireland to audiences all over the world that maybe are interested in Yeats, are drawn to Ireland by Yeats. And that was particularly true in India, where I came across many people who were fascinated by Yeats and who were drawn to Ireland really by, you know, by their interest in W.B. Yeats. And I've used that over the years uh, during my career to introduce people to Ireland using Yeats and Joyce and other great writers as a means of telling Yeats' story. There's a great Irish radio program every Sunday morning called Sunday Miscellany. It's been going on forever. And in, to, to my mind, if I had to describe Joe's book, I would describe it as a Yeats miscellany because he brings together all these great lines from Yeats. He doesn't just put them there on the page in front of you like an anthology. He meditates on them and his meditations are profound, typical of Joe Hassan. And I really have come to admire and, uh, and regard as a deeply important friend to me, Joe Hassan, in my time here in, uh, in, in uh, Washington the past three years. Joe and I have become firm friends and we're constantly uh, talking to each other about our shared passion for Ireland, uh, for Irish literature and for W.B. Yeats. So, I now have the pleasure of uh, calling upon uh, a great Irish um, mezzo-soprano, uh, a friend of mine from my time in um, Germany, and also I knew her in London, and I've, I've met her again here in, um, in the United States, Tara Errett, who will now perform a wonderful version of uh, Yeats's Had I the Heavens in Bridal Cloths. So thank you for tuning into this event. Uh, thank you, Joe. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you, Colleen, for bringing it together. It's been a wonderful uh, discussion of Yates' work. I now hand over to the beautiful voice of Tara Erish.